Tere kuulate Investeerimisklubi podcasti. Kõik on hästi pea, püsti sõidad, kuulad seda piti silmist on. Steve has been already, you traveled to Estonia about uh, on Monday, so has, has had time to go around a little bit. We took uh, him and uh, the assistant to uh, also the Debog or a swamp, which was uh, probably incredible. Uh, what amazing. are the feelings? Uh, Absolutely amazing, yeah. How do you uh, find this opulent place here? Because not, not too many uh, festivals or, uh, <laughs> or uh, seminars happen in outdoors and on, on pure grass. I, hey you guys, I love it. I mean, it reminds me of home. I was raised in a home with a bonfire, so I mean, what's not to like about this setting right now? A little bit of background of, uh, of Stieg. Stieg. Stieg has studied business analysis uh, at Harvard University and uh, he's a former college uh, professor. Um, before Stieg took uh, up stock investing, he worked for uh, one of uh, Europe's leading uh, energy trading companies. Stig is uh, right now living his dream of uh, creating educational fi finance uh, uh, content on one of the one of the world's most uh, popular investment podcasts called uh, TIP, the In Investors Podcast. Uh, also, um, living the dream uh, by running the investment company Stig uh, Brothers and Holding. So, can you all put your hands together for Stig? <laughs> Let's try to uh, make ourselves comfortable on this uh, beanie bags. Steve, first of all, um, many people don't know you because obviously um, you don't live here. And, uh, no. uh, and, but we're really glad that uh, we could uh, fly you over and also you decided to come here. Um, as you know, as we talked already before, uh, Investment Club is a community of investors and that's something you do as well with TIP but globally. So uh, we're really glad to, uh, to bring you here and you can share your knowledge to the Estonian investment community. Well, thank you for, for inviting me. I mean, it's, uh, it's an amazing ride. I was so lucky to be here, what, 12 years ago and now I'm just happy I have a chance to, uh, to go back. And uh, to start off, I wanted to ask you about uh, your background to get more familiar to all of the people listening here. So can you please uh, share something about your uh, professional career, uh, background and, and school and education? Yeah, um, come from a background in, uh, in finance, international business. That was kind of like how it, uh, how it started. And um, upon graduation, I got a, a job as a commodities trader. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It's very far from what I do now in terms of, of value investing. Especially when you're trading uh, within the day, um, it can be very, very stressful. You would be opening and closing positions within minutes, sometimes seconds. So it's, uh, it's definitely a, a very different experience. Um, and then left. Um, you know, often I get asked this question, so like the drive, like why did you start your own company? Why, why didn't you continue on that path? And commodities trading, the, basically the, uh, the background I should have and what I should pursue. And I think it basically boils down to fear. And <laughs> I know it, it kind of comes up where it comes across like, what do you mean by fear? It's really the, uh, the fear of going back to the corporate financial world. I mean, as you said yourself, Marco, you would, you would never have a meeting in a place like this, right? So it's, uh, it's a very, very different experience. And uh, honestly, fear is, is really a big, big driver. Never going back to, the, uh, to that world. Can you talk a little bit about that? So what was the fear about? So many people who start investing just want to get a little bit richer, want to be a millionaire. There's so many dreams around uh, investing and finance. But you were driven, driven by fear. So what did it really mean to you? What did you fear of? Well, uh, I just got married, uh, actually, uh, uh, while I was a student, um, um, and um, just got a job right upon graduation, as said. And I didn't see my wife for, she was actually also uh, trading in the same company. Um, I didn't see my wife for 18 months. And so I was like, 
I don't want to live that life. I mean, it, it's just, it kind of, um, I know it sounds spoiled, but I just really hate being stressed out. Oh my god, I don't like that. And it seems like a lot of things that are happening in the financial world is just stressful for the sake of being stressful. Not necessarily because we need to do that. So no, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to do that again. And when was that uh, that you started uh, taking more interest in investing? You know, I, I think I've always been highly interested in investing, um, and and honestly, I think that a lot of that spirit was more or less killed. Well, whenever I was a student, like for those of you who are so unlucky also to have a business degree, you kind of learn in school that you're. You can't really pick stocks or you can't really pick bonds. It's, it's primarily about the, the stock market is always priced correctly. So no reason really to give too much thought into that. We don't talk about valuations uh, at all. So it was um, it was uh, it was definitely a, a weird experience. No, but basically to I guess to to answer your question uh, about like investing and how did it all come across? Um, so. The way I remember this a long time ago is that I was sitting with, with some friends and some genius among the friends was saying something to the likes of, wouldn't it be cool to have a lot of money? You know, <laughs> something that I guess a lot of people can resonate with. And uh, then there was this other guy who was saying, um, well, can't we just do what other successful people have been doing like why do we need to be original in anything we do can we just see what the most successful people are doing and then replicate that so modest as I am uh, whenever I came uh, home I uh, looked up the Forbes 400 list so the Forbes 400 list um, really a list of the uh, wealthiest people on the planet and uh, at that time it was Bill Gates so I was I was starting from the very top right and, uh, and Bill Gates you know he, he seemed like a smart guy. Um, honestly, I had problems doing PowerPoint presentations, so the thought of creating and writing a code for my own operating system was not super appealing to me. <laughs> so I jumped to number two, and that was Warren Buffett. And I was like, huh, what do I know about Warren Buffett? Um, not, not too much, uh, honestly. I knew he was picking stocks, and, and it kind of appealed to me. I mean, I remember this quote where he was saying, I make money sitting on my ass and wait. And I was like, yes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so that's, that's a cool way how to uh, start, like basically someone threw out there an idea that we could be, or we could all be uh, millionaires or richer. And then you took out the Forbes uh, 400 list and started to look from the top who are the richest and who can I mimic in order to become successful. So is that the place where you um, started to see or dig into value investing a little bit more? Yes, uh, definitely. And it just seemed to me that the way of thinking really, it just, it just appealed to me. Um, the, the thought about doing trading, and again, there's nothing wrong with trading per se. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but you, you aren't really, you aren't building anything and you are, you're primarily looking at this, you know, stock ticker, you're looking at this price, you know, it's going up and down and you're like selling and buying within <coughs> seconds or minutes. It's just, it's just a very stressful way of, of, of living and then Warren Buffett comes along and, well, he's been in the universe for the investing universe for quite some time and, and he talks about how spending adequate time on analyzing good companies and just hold on to them and it just seemed to be a more sustainable way of of making a decent living and again the sitting on your ass doing nothing that appealed too you don't do that as a trader you're it's a there's a very, very different world let me put it like that who from the audience has a little bit of trouble by just waiting and not selling he's not too too patient oh me too yeah there's yeah. Uh, there's <laughs> many here and also doing culture who was here previously said that uh, he, one, one of the key things is to be patient yeah. and, and you still, uh, when you're looking at the stock market all the time, it's really hard to be patient uh, because you see all these movements all the time. Oh yeah, 100%. It's, uh, 
it can be very stressful, and you sometimes you you know you get this emotional attachment. You know, then you buy, I don't know, um, Coca Cola at like forty bucks, and you're kind of like almost mad at Coca Cola if it's trading at thirty eight. It's almost like it's personal, and you know, at the end of the day, the stock doesn't care, right? The stock doesn't care what you bought it at. But that's kind of your anchor price. It's supposed to be forty plus, and you just. It almost becomes personal, you know. It's not a. <laughs> it can be frustrating. Can you also talk a little bit about your portfolio because uh, you conduct your portfolio using value investing as well? Right. Um, so can you talk about your portfolio? How does it look like? What are the returns? I think many of us are interesting to hear. Interested to hear. Yeah, um, I have a generally a very concentrated portfolio. I think right now I have eight picks. Um, and there, even even in value investing, I do want to say that you can you can have a lot more picks. Uh, it's very popular, also, especially in the states, to uh, to buy a broad uh, range of, of very cheap companies. And you might not know all of them in detail. And then you have other people who are more concentrated, uh, who then would go in and do a bit more analysis, and uh, and based on that, then come up with valuations uh, and whatnot. Uh, Top holdings would include something like uh, Berkshire Hathaway, um, Chrysler, um, uh, also Fairfax India. So that's um, that's quite a few uh, picks. Um, and 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 continuing here, I just want to say that I remember whenever I started investing, I was looking for that you know good stock pick. So this is really my my caveat to that. I mean, there's there's no such thing as a good stock pick or a good stock, per se, or a good company. I mean, you can say something like Starbucks. It's a great company for a lot of different reasons. But right now it's trading at, what, 56 bucks? I mean, that stock is a great, fantastic stock pick, if you like, if you can compare price and value if it was trading at 30 bucks. And it would be a horrible investment if it was trading at 200. So, yes, you can definitely make a great investment, but that's not the same thing as buying a great company, it's, it's two very uh, different things. How did you find those picks? So you mentioned three uh, top picks uh, which you have, for example, Berkshire Hathaway. How did you, what do you do in order to find that uh, investment? Uh, can you share, the, uh, share your uh, background on that? Yeah, it's, um, so Berkshire Hathaway is kind of like one-off, because everyone who is into value investing, um, it's 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 kind of like um, and don't get me wrong when I say this, but it, it's more like if you're into cycling and you're like, how did you how did you know that there was this race called Tour de France? You know, it's like Berkshire Hathaway is just right in your face like all the time, and that's uh, that's amazing. So I think that that's kind of like a one-off. It was not like it was going into a stock screener or I was speaking to a trusted source. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway in his own right is one of the, I think it's right now it's listed as the sixth or the seventh uh, largest company um, in the US. So it was definitely not one of those uh, under the radar. But what about one of the other ones which you really uh, bought because of the value? Yeah, so it could be a, it could be a company like uh, Fiat Chrysler. And um, there is a lot, of, a lot of good things to be said about um, really going to the to the weeds of, of knowing a business. Um, just like if you were to buy a car, you would have a pretty good idea of what's the value of that car. You would do the same thing with a stock. So you would go in and say, how much money do I expect for this company to make in the years to come and why? And, uh, and then you uh, discount your, the cash flows. Then you're, it's kind of like saying, so what is that worth today? Like all the future earnings, what is that worth today? You compare it to uh, to the price and what it's trading at. So that way you you kind of like take into account: is this a good company? Yes, yes, it was great, and it is a great company. But do I really get a bang for my buck here? Um, and that's that's really where it all starts. What are the few uh, examples of uh, of the other companies you looked at? Um, Southwest Airlines, for instance. Um, and that's uh, that's very interesting. So whenever you talk about uh, a company, you can't just look at that specific company, you will look at the industry, you will look at competitors. So 
Uh, a lot of interesting things are happening in the airline industry right now. Um, historically, it has been hated, and it's been hated with good reason. I mean, you can probably come up with a hundred companies at least we've gone bankrupt over the past few decades. Uh, but quite a few things has happened. Um, there's been a consolidation. I'm primarily talking about the US market here, uh, but even so in Europe. And a consolidation, so you see fewer and fewer airlines. Um, less competition is typically really, really bad for us as consumers. It's fantastic if you're a shareholder. It typically means higher profit margins. And um, and that kind of changed. So you have a lot of you have a lot of fundamental changes. Um, the, the generation who became uh, flight attendants, pilots, um, born in the uh, the fifties and sixties, um, they're about to retire. Actually, if you were if you were hired in the golden age, those people who are retiring right now, you'll be making three times as much as if you were going into the industry right now for the exact same job. So those contracts are running out. And new people are coming in, they're doing the exact same thing, but the cost structure is now very, very different. <laughs> so um, there, there was quite a few factors, there was two of them, but quite a few factors that really, um, really made it more interesting. And then the, the next pick, uh, or the next step is more, okay, so now that we know this, can we pick the winner? And um, some people might argue it would be another company, and some people might argue that it might be this company, but that's kind of like how, how it, the analysis starts, and it's all about getting all the tailwind as you can, and then uh, reap the benefits of that. So, um, quite many companies, or like a bunch of companies, all together seven, eight companies in your portfolio, uh, but it seems like all the eggs are in, in the same basket, or um, what do you think about diversification, and how do you manage risks uh, on, on your portfolio? Yeah, so uh, that's really great, uh, great question. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say that eight picks are a good number. I think there's a lot of good things to be said about having at least 15 or 20. Um, if you look at uh, this, like number of securities, uh, you would have this rule of thumb that you would typically need uh, 20 picks that are somewhat uncorrelated to take advantage of, of what you would typically call the, uh, the stock market risk. There's not necessarily a lot to gain by diversifying more than that. Uh, one of the reasons is that, um, to me, and I might easily be wrong enough now, um, it seems to be that we are at the top of the, uh, of the market cycle. And when you are that, it might be a good idea to uh, access some of your positions. It might not be as attractive and as appealing anymore. And uh, especially in times like these, you might really look into the debt situation. There's been a lot of bad debt coming into the market. So uh, that was something I personally had to, to sell out of. And then really, um, since, I, since the US is really my, my home market and really where I feel I have the most information, I'm also starting to look into other, other asset classes. So it's not necessarily being fully invested in, uh, in Apex. I don't think I would recommend that for anyone. What are the other, some of other asset classes you're looking at? So I've, uh, I've been fortunate to have some opportunities in, uh, in real estate. Uh, real estate is very uh, different uh, than stocks. I mean, stock markets in general are more correlated, like even, I guess, in a country like Estonia, you would then say, well, you have many different markets, right? Because you have many different local markets. Um, the real estate I'm looking at, it's, it's primarily in the US, but, but it also depends on where you, where you enter. Uh, in really in the chain. So uh, in this situation, it would be uh, buying foreclosures, uh, having someone to fix it up for you, and as a management company to run it. So it's kind of like, depending on where you are, there will be different, uh, a different upside, but clearly also a different, uh, different downside. So um, it's not necessarily so that real estate investing is good at the top of a market cycle, or it's bad. It's more, it's really, it really depends. Um, and right now, especially in the, um, if you look at the stock markets in the, uh, in the West, they're just very, very expensive. So uh, the returns really aren't there compared to the risk that you might incur. Uh, and then another asset class would be something as simple as, as cash, being liquid whenever the good opportunities come up. I, I think um, 
I can also agree on that. So, kind of have the same view on, on my portfolio as as you have on yours. Um, so, set, having some money on side in order to uh, see what's coming next as as the market is a little bit high. But uh, we could be wrong, like you said. <laughs> oh yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, we talked about a little bit of, about your portfolio, how to see the risks. Uh, just kind of a little bit inside it there, but uh, maybe. It's good to um, create a little bit of context behind. So, what does investing mean to you, and what's your like bigger goal behind uh, investing? You know, it's uh, I think it's a way of living more than anything else, and and, and not just really into uh, into stock investing. I think really the concept of, of investing that would be would go anywhere, right? So why do we take an education? I mean, it's an investment yourself. Um, why would you, why would you exercise? Well, you know, it's it's it's, it's an investment in, in your own health. I mean, if you're really a, a numbers geek like I surely am, you know, you can you can actually go in and, and you know calculate if I exercise this in that many minutes, what would that do to my longevity? I mean, it, it is truly investment in yourself. You can there is a there is a cap to that. You can't just keep on running like Forrest Gump and. <laughs> then you will live forever. It doesn't work like that, but there is a lot to be said about being very, very active. So you can do that in many, many different ways. And um, like I said before, I'm, I'm very lazy. So it's an advantage having money working for you instead of working for money. And uh, everybody here knows that uh, you are one of the hosts and one of the co-founders of um, The Investors Podcast, which is a really famous podcast there. Um, and and there, you've done done it over two years now, um, and many many episodes. So you probably learned a bunch. So uh, what have you learned, to, like from doing that podcast, which has helped you in in your value investing and in your portfolio? Yeah, I mean it's uh, we are so we're four years in the making now, uh, quickly approaching two hundred episodes, and um, you know having the chance to speak to a lot of. People that are a lot smarter than I am, uh, lucky for, luckily. Um, and I think what just really surprised me is how how humble these smart people are. I mean, they they have everything, you know, according to most uh, financial measures, and they're just so humble, and they are they're ready to change their mind like so fast, and they do not paint themselves into a corner. They're always questioning their own decision. And why they're doing what they're doing, and I think that's some that's something that's really surprised me. I think going into this, this was just the the people who are most certain of themselves just had the answers, and it seems like the most successful people and the richest people, they they acknowledge that they do not have all the right answers, so they are always learning, always reading, always improving themselves. That's uh, that's something um, I think we've also learned uh, from doing the investment club as well. So having a chance to talk with uh, a lot of really smart people, a lot smarter than we are, that uh, that's the common denominator between all of them: uh, humble and also willingness to learn. And that's also what Tim talked about a little bit before: just learning how to learn. Oh things. yeah, hundred percent. And and also the. The idea of not wanting to be the smartest guy in the room. I mean, you're you're heading for 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 problems ahead. I mean, if if you were always the smartest guy in the room, you were you were the average of the five people you surround yourself with the most, right? So why would you surround yourself with people who are not smarter than you, where you can we can learn from, right? And you can you can improve. I would like to open the floor for uh, some questions for Steve because we uh, are. Uh, running over the time here, but uh, happy to take some questions. Markus, do you have the mic as well? Yes. It usually takes uh, nine seconds in order to get a question. All right. Time. So first question to uh, to the right side, and then I saw Jonathan. Uh, Lord Jonathan has another question there. Hi. Do you have some book suggestions for us on investing or about life or some books you think that every one of us should read in their life? 
Thanks. That's a good question. Um, quite a few good, uh, good books. Um, one of the classics would be uh, Stephen Covey's book, um, The Habits of Highly Successful People. You know, he has seven habits. I think they are extremely insightful. And I think before starting investing in, in stocks and in real estate and bonds, whatnot, start by investing in yourself. So if you would like to have a 10x return on any investment, uh, go ahead and, and buy that book. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, in terms of other uh, books that are more uh, investment related, um, specifically a book like The Intelligent Investor is hard to, uh, to, to get around. I mean, it's, it's really value investing. So it, it's kind of like, if the question is more so what is the best value investing books, it's kind of different from what is a good investing book. And in general, a lot of people would say that uh, it's, it's just one. Uh, every alpha investing, I would agree with that. Um, the Intelligent Investor is quite difficult to, uh, to, to read, though. So uh, another book um, that I could, could mention would be One of Wall Street by Peter Lynch, a very, very successful mutual fund guy and a Magellan Fund. And um, I think that's good. I mean, he talks in layman's terms, you know, something I can understand in terms of how do you identify good investments? Uh, he brings in a little accounting, but not too much, and he does not discourage the reader like uh, many other investment uh, authors. So, so that was one up on Wall Street. Yes, it's a uh, it's it's a classic, and you can probably buy it on Amazon for ten bucks, twelve bucks, perhaps. All right, and uh, Lord Jonathan, please your question. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I still remember when I found the Investors podcast and you still had 16th or 17th episode back then. Um, and my question is uh, a tiny bit related to that, that uh, probably you already know that we have here this investment podcast also, Investerimis <laughs> Radio, uh, with Christian Tauri. Probably you have comment commented something somewhere already or or so. But uh, my real question is that uh, uh, how much do you know about maybe some other podcasts or something that you, you kind of have initiated without knowing it yourself? How much feedback have you got already that something has happened because you started this uh, podcast? Thank you. Well, um, thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's always great with a, with a pat on your back. Um, you know, it's been, it's, it's been an amazing ride. Um, and, and it makes you humble to think uh, what we have achieved in a relatively uh, short period of time. I do want to say that um, we were, we're four years in the making. We had something before that, so we kind of like had a head start. It was not just like we started a, a podcast and then suddenly people just flopped. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we already had a, had a small community uh, to starting with. Um, but uh, really to respond to your question, um, I'm so lucky that I get f flooded inbox, or I have a flooded inbox every morning. I uh, I wake up, and uh, sometimes people say not too many nice things, but most of the time they do say nice things, and a lot of them are saying um, thank you for um, for helping them set up a company or helping them with the portfolio. You have one email from a guy who said that uh, because of investment or stock picks. He could afford a wedding ring, so he was actually just got engaged. So that was a pretty amazing story. <laughs> I don't know if I would uh, if I would trust the investors podcast as much as that in terms of deciding whether or not you should marry your fiance. <laughs> um, but no, and, and, and I mean I, I really can't take much credit for that. I think it's all about when are you ready to take the next uh, step. Um, I remember back in the days I read um, two books that really. Um, made a huge impact on me. Uh, impact on me. The first one that was House to Influence and Influence People. Uh, one of it was actually Warren Buffett's favorite book, uh, which was how it came on my radar. And I think for a lot of people who read that book today, they would say that is such a mundane book. Like, that, why is that so special? And I think it's it's all about reading the right book at the right time in your life and really. Really, when you are ready to to make a change, and I was I was I was in a rut at the time. There were a ton of stuff that, that really didn't work out with me. 
for me, uh, a lot of the personal relationships that I that I had, they have kind of gone down south. Realizing then after reading the books, there was probably not the world's fault. It was probably my fault that 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 um, things were not working according to plan. So, um, whenever I get all these uh, kind words, uh, as I was getting here, uh, I I think that that my own contribution is minuscule, definitely less than one percent, and the rest is really that person taking it to the next level. Yeah, that's a good answer. Jonathan was like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's a question on the left side in the back. Hello. Thank you very much for the story. I uh, really hope that uh, you're going to stay here a little bit longer to have a conversation with you, especially uh, about uh, the airline sector, because I'm also a big fan of it. Uh, but my question is uh, about Warren Buffett. As I understand, you are a fan of him. Uh, but uh, markets uh, have changed, uh, more people get access to the stock market uh, and uh, there are a lot of people that now saying that Warren Buffett's philosophy uh, now kind of outdated and it doesn't work uh, as efficiently as it used to work in the 70s and uh, maybe even 80s. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, do you still uh, follow his uh, philosophy strategy, and what would be your suggestions? Yeah, so uh, Warren Buffett's uh, stock market record, it's, it's, really, it's really uncanny. So uh, if you look at, at his company, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, from uh, 65, I want to say, was founded. I mean, it's more than five decades, and I think right now the, uh, the track record is 19.1% uh, compounded. Even before then, whenever he had his general partnerships, it was even higher than that. Um, I definitely think there's something to it. I think the criticism is correct to some extent. And so back when Warren Buffett started and, and how he really made his 50% returns back in the 50s, yes, 5-0 returns annually. Uh, first of all, it was with a small amount of money. It's very, very difficult with the amount of, of cash he's sitting on right now to make those type, uh, type of returns. So. Um, the market cap of Berkshire Hathaway is close to $500 billion. He would sit on more than $100 billion in cash right now. Uh, stock portfolio already quickly approaching two, uh, $200 billion. So, so it's really hard to make moves. So if you look at his uh, recent uh, large um, um, put, um, position in Apple, you know, $42 billion. No, Apple is not going to return 19% or 20%, not even kind of close. I think most people would be surprised if he can sustain a, a double-digit performance because it's just very, very difficult to do that with so much money. Like the universe are really, really changing um, if, when you have so much money. So that's, that's one part of it. The other thing uh, about this criticism is that whenever Warren Buffett started, um, the concept of a cash flow statement, it was just, it was not known. So. Basically, he had access to information that other people say they wouldn't have. Like, he can say uh, what he called the owner's earnings or very close to the free cash flow, so how much money is really flowing back to the owners of, of the company. He could, he could calculate that before other people could. Uh, before they, today, people need that cash flow status, but he, he kind of knew how to do that. He could already pick the numbers. So he had a huge advantage in that, and now with more people coming in, it's just like, the airline industry, whatever we're talking about, like the more competition, uh, the lower the margins. So uh, definitely, yeah, it's it's harder to make money in in mal investing in general in in investing. As as the markets mature, it becomes harder and harder to uh, to beat the market. And the American stock market is likely the most. I wouldn't I wouldn't just call it the most efficient market per se, but it's definitely the most mature market. So there are a lot of system, systemic. Uh, reasons why no stock market or real estate market for that matter can, cannot be uh, efficient and really be priced as it should. Uh, but yeah, the anomalies that you see in the market becomes harder and harder. Um, but, and, and the last thing I want to add to this is really that even if we both follow a value investing uh, approach, say that we look at the airline industry, say that you think that Delta is the best pick or and I would say that I would agree with you. If you would still come up with two different um, numbers for the intrinsic value of that company, simply because even if you use the same formula, 
I might have a different growth rate than you have. You might perceive the future cost differently, whatever it is. So a really, really good value investor is really good at projecting those future cash flows. He would still have an advantage. And uh, did you get your answer, sir? Yeah, thank you. Pretty good. And he's going to ask you about the airlines as well after. Perfect. All, all the links you have, all the information you have on that. <laughs> uh, and uh, Pavo is going to finish up the question round so we could enjoy the fire a little bit too. Hello, Pavo And glad to meet you personally. So let's give some human touch at the end of that. Uh, you spoke about this law of five people around you. Who are the five people uh, surrounding you? Oh, can you explain a bit, uh, describe these people? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I think uh, one of them would be my uh, my co-host uh, Preston. He is uh, he's a smart dude. I'm gonna tell you that. Um, and um, and I think uh, I can mention all uh, all five, but. Um, I think the most important investment that you can make would be your uh, significant other. Uh, I want, do want to say I think I, I made a good investment on that one. Um, you know, there's something to be said about surrounding yourself with the right people. And the person you're typically surrounded uh, by the most, um, if you do not work as a commodities trader, that is, um, that would be your wife or your husband or significant other. And um, and I think that's 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 so important. Like, how how vulnerable can you be? How much can you improve? How much can that person take you to the next level um, in 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 whatever way? And then then I also really want to say, uh, people on the TIP team. There are so many smart people, and if you do not feel Energized, and I know that for introverts, I'm definitely an introvert. For introverts, uh, it can be taxing being around other people. But if you do not feel this, if you feel like like people who, who might you consider uh, who you might consider smart, if you if you do not feel that you become energized, you do not feel that you're that that person is really giving something back to you, then it's then it's not the right person to surround yourself with. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why we, we created this mastermind group that we, that we have on the podcast. Um, we are um, four or five members in the group. I'm definitely the least smart uh, in the group. And, and I also want to say that's definitely on purpose because as mentioned, I want to grow, I want to improve. I'm, I'm heading for big uh, <laughs> troubles ahead if I'm the smartest guy in the group and certainly uh, I'm not. So uh, I would say people who are very thorough with their analysis and, uh, and people who are always ready to question themselves and question you, uh, whether it's 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 uh, business or it's uh, it's personal. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Steve, for the answers. I think it's time to put your hands together and do a big applause for Steve. Yeah.